Welcome to Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Jolene Abanez, and I am your worship associate today. I'm joined by Reverend Sean Wilcher, our minister. Uh, Beth Syverson, our director of music ministries, is off today, but we have a group of guest musicians led by Susan Shaw and wrangled by Steve Morihiro. And we have Karen Magoon Pearson, who is our Director of Religious Education for Children and Youth, and welcoming you this morning. We also would like to recognize the many volunteers that have helped put this service together today. There's many of them. There they are on the board. We respectfully recognize that our church property rests on a Hachiman and Tongva land. As Unitarian Universalists, we have many different beliefs, but we are one loving community. We are bound together, not by a common set of rules or beliefs, but rather a covenant. A covenant is a promise, a promise that whatever our beliefs, we accept one another and encourage each other in spiritual growth. We affirm that all life has inherent value and that all existence is interconnected. We strive for justice and compassion in our deeds and relationships. We are committed to creating a welcoming com a community without regard to the traits that sometimes divide people. To our roomers, we invite you to silence your cell phones. And for our Zoomers, we would love it if you would say hello in the chat. I want to extend a special welcome to visitors. If you're seeking a spiritual home, we hope that you will find it here. Later in the service, you will have an opportunity to introduce yourself if you would like to do so. We begin our worship with the lighting of our chalice. This morning, I'd like to invite someone I barely know, Joel Abanez. <laughs> Uh, he's been a member of this community for seven years since we moved back from Virginia. All together, love is the spirit of this church and service is its law to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love and to help one another. This we affirm together. Please join us in singing our opening song. So this morning, we're talking about a really fun topic, reparations and repair. This is a pretty much a hot topic out there that people are really struggling with, right? And you know, we're Unitarian Universalists, so we don't shy away from tough topics. Uh, so all we ask is that you, you know, 
keep an open mind and open heart, open hands and all of this. Because, you know, not everybody agrees, right? Not all people of color agree, not all white people agree. We're still trying to figure all of this out. And believe me when I tell you I've been struggling with it too. So and I'm not going to here to tell you what to think because, of course, as Unitarian Universalists, we don't do that. But I want you to come to your own conclusions and to do it with an open heart and open mind. So you'll get some of my ideas, which you can feel, feel free to leave or not. I want to also let you know that I'm going to be focusing, because of due to time constraints, I have just so much time, I am focusing on reparations for African Americans in this country, um, not Native Americans or Japanese Americans or any of those other issues, just time constraints. There's so much that I had to fit in today. Because some of it is really kind of creating a lot of this anxiety around what's going to happen, how are we going to do this, and so I thought that we could sort of sit in that liminal space today of like, well, we're still figuring this out. What does this mean, right? So let's begin with these opening words by Gretchen Haley. She begins like this. What's going to happen? Will everything be OK? What can I do? In these days, we find ourselves too often stuck with these questions on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be OK? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails as if this new zodiac is capable of forecasting all that life may yet bring our way, as if we could prepare, as if life have never, had made any promises of making sense or turning out the way we thought, as if we're not also actors in this still unfolding story. For this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from the needing to know, the yearning to have it all figured out, and also the burden of believing we either have all the control or none. Here in our song, in our silence, our stories, and our sharing, we make space for a new breath, a new healing, a new possibility to take root. This is courage forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith, that we believe still a new world is possible, that we are creating it already here and now. So come, let us worship together. Little kid in a small town I did my best just to fit in Broke my heart on the playground When they said I was different Oh, now Now I'm all grown up and nothing has changed Yeah, it's still the same It's a hard life on easy street just white painted picket fence as far as you can see if you think we live in the land of the free you should try to be black like me my daddy worked day and night for an old house and a used car Just to live that good life mm. It shouldn't be twice as hard Oh, now Now I'm all grown up and nothing has changed It's a hard life On easy street Just one painted picket fence As far as you can see If you think in the land of the free, you should try to be oh black like me. Oh, I know I'm not the only one who, oh, yeah. who feels like I, I don't believe. On easy street, 
just white painted picket fences far as you can see and if you think we live in a land of the free you should try to be Black like me. Our story this morning is called How to Apologize. It's a very cute cartoon by David uh, La Rochelle and illustrated by Mike Wanuka, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Everyone makes mistakes. Whether you are big or small. And when you've made a mistake that has hurt someone or something, the right thing to do is apologize. Apologizing can be hard, especially if the other person is mad. or if it's someone you don't like. But it's important to apologize anyway, even if that person owes you an apology too. Your apology can be simple. Tell the other person you're sorry for what you did. I'm sorry I borrowed your socks without permission. Don't make excuses. I'm usually much more careful, but I had an itch on my knee and a mosquito flew down my throat and I was trying to avoid a dangerous looking crack in the sideway, sidewalk and if your ladder wasn't taking up so much space, I wouldn't have bumped into it. No. Yes. I'm sorry I knocked you over. And be sincere, not sincere. Mom told me I had to apologize for putting your doll in the fishbowl or I can't go outside and play baseball, so I'm sorry. Not sincere. Ha ha, I'm sorry I accidentally squirted you with the garden hose when you were weeding the flower bed. <laughs> but you have to admit, you look hilarious. Ha ha ha. Not sincere. Look at the new glow-in-the-dark watch I got for my birthday, and I'm having a cupcake party on Saturday. And I'm sorry I sat on your violin, and guess who's going to be the star of the dance recital next week? Me! Sincere. I'm sorry I popped your balloon. I really am. You can always, sorry, you can also apologize with a note. Even if the mistake happened a long time ago, it's never too late to apologize. Do you remember back in 1987 when I called you pokey pants? Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. If possible, try to fix the mistake. But sometimes you can't. In that case, you can still say you're sorry, then take steps to avoid making the same mistake again. We're very, very sorry. It might be difficult, but apologizing will make you feel better. More importantly, it will make the other person feel better. And that's why we apologize. All right, I'd like to invite Judy Tomlinson up here to light our children's chalice, and then we'll sing our children out to the religious education classes. If they would like to go.
at peace as you go, as you go, to nurture the spark of your precious life. We hold you in our love as you go. So I thought we'd start this morning with a, a little history. On January, in January, I think it was January 12th of 1865, it was toward the end of the Civil War, the last few months, 20 black ministers made their way toward a very great mansion in Savannah, Georgia. They were greeted by their hosts, which was the Union Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton, and General William Sherman. The general and the secretary had invited these ministers to come and speak on behalf of freed slaves who were tagging along after the Union Army without anywhere else to go in the hostile Confederate lands. Sherman and Stanton asked them a number of questions, whether the ministers believed black people in the South would fight for the Union Army, whether they believed they would be able to participate in society after being freed. And most surprising, Sherman in particular asked, what do you want for your own people following the war? In talking about it and in response, the Reverend Garrison Frazier responded, the way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. And we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. We want to be placed on land until we're able to buy it and make it our own. So four days later, General Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15, which seized 400 acres, 400,000 acres of coastal land from South Carolina down to Northern Florida, declaring that any formerly enslaved person could claim up to 40 acres. The mule, by the way, came much later. The order itself detailed this. It said, these lands are reserved and set apart for the settlement of the Negroes now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the President of the United States. Moreover, the sole and exclusive management of affairs is to be left to the freed peoples themselves, and the military authorities will afford them protection until such time as they can protect themselves or until Congress shall regulate their title. By June, so remember this was January, by June, just a few months afterwards, 40,000 freed people had migrated to the coast and President Lincoln in Congress had established the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands to manage the property titles. However, it was also just a few months after that, a short period that President Lincoln was assassinated. His successor, Andrew Johnson, who was a Southern sympathizer and a conservative uh, versus Lincoln, quickly overturned the special field order number, number 15, and that fall saw the eviction of the newly settled black families and the repatriating of the land back to the elite uh, planting class there that were all white. And that is the first and only instance in American history of any kind of reparations that were made specifically for slavery and that promise has never been fulfilled. I wanna point out something. I mean, have you ever noticed, I don't know about you, know, I do this sort of in my own life, but I notice that we do this in our history too, that we tend to focus on what went wrong in our history, right? But our history is filled also with some good decisions. Our history is replete with this back and forth, good and bad decisions. So for example, the government allowed and encouraged slavery in parts of our nation. Boo. Then it ended slavery and promised 40 acres. Yay. But then Andrew Johnson took that away. Boo. Then there was a brief moment of reconstruction, 12 years following the Civil War in the South, where even black legislators were voted into office. Yay. Then you had the rise of the KKK and other uh, uh, white supremacy groups that the government failed to protect their black citizens and the Jim Crow era began with redlining, segregation, lynching, etc. Boo. <laughs> well, until finally people fought for civil rights in the 60s and we ended segregation. Yay. <laughs> and since then, everyone thinks that maybe we're done, but we still have this mass incarceration. We have systemic racism and people freaking about talking about CRT or critical race theory. Boo. Okay. 
So we have this history of going just so far to fix the atrocities that have been committed, and then the political wind shifts and people of color kind of get the shaft. But we also have a history of trying to do right. So what is the right thing now, right? What can we do now? Now, some people think that that means reparations, that this is the rightness that is long overdue as a way of giving them finally their 40 acres. So what exactly are reparations? So reparations refer to the act of providing compensation for wrongs of the past. It's sort of part of an apology, right? You saw our time for all ages, like there's saying you're sorry, not doing it again, all those things. It's part of the fix it part. Now reparations can take very various forms, but the most common of that is financial compensation. But how that financial compensation is given out can be vastly different. And we get very bogged down into this debate, right? Should the monies go to individuals? Are we talking about community investments and programs? How do we trace lineage? Are we talking about black people or all people of color or indigenous people? Would reparations bankrupt the federal government? What is this gonna cost me? Is throwing money at the problem really gonna solve systemic racism? How do you do this fairly? All of these questions, right? They're big and important questions. But I think there's one thing I, I want you to, to know that, that the black people are not out to take what all of us have, right? No one is saying, no one that I know of that's certainly reasonable, is saying that people have to give up their land or businesses or somehow you have to pay out of pocket. That kind of rhetoric actually creates a lot of fear and anger, so please don't go there. Reparations is really, what it's really about is wealth accumulation, okay? That is, blacks have been denied the ability to accumulate wealth and they, like their ancestors, simply want the ability to do so. Property is how wealth is accumulated in this country, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries. But because of past inequities, even over 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement, wealth inequity between black and white Americans is at the same level it was in 1968. And why? Why is that? And there's lots of reasons, but the biggest one, something called redlining, I think most of you know what about redlining is, you know, carving out areas that were good areas versus bad areas. And redlining uh, created a prosperity divide by keeping black homes at lower values and making credit almost impossible to obtain, can't get loans, which effectively excludes black families from the American dream. So is there then anything we as individuals or as a church, anything we can do to help with reparations? What does it mean for us as Unitarian Universalists, we who have these principles that say that we create a world of peace, liberty, and justice for all, that we affirm and promote the dignity and worth of all? Well, I was really intrigued by um, what one Unitarian Universalist had to say. His name is Kenneth Collier, um, and he, this is Kenneth, I actually know him, he's a really lovely guy. He wrote a book um, called The Great Wound, Confessions of a Slaveholding Family. He got interested in genealogy and found out that he had a long history of slaveholding in his family. And so this is what he decided that he was gonna do. And it might surprise you. So he wrote this. He said, my African American friends insist on the necessity of honoring our ancestors. To honor the ancestors is to embrace our heritage and carry it forward in our turn. He writes, I believe this, and it's one of the things that led me into genealogy. But understanding my genealogy has presented me with a serious problem. It's easy to honor ancestors when those ancestors were honorable, but what does it do when one's forebearers were dishonorable? My parents were good and gentle, kind and compassionate people. When I look back through the generations of my ancestors, though, I find an unbroken string of slaveholding giving way to the neo-slavery of Jim Crow and on into the racism of the 20th century. My family's dishonorable history begins at least in the mid-1600s and quite possibly earlier. For just one example, my ancestor, Lockie Collier, was murdered in 1778 by the people he enslaved, presumably because of the harsh way he treated them. How is it possible to honor such a man and others like him? 
Are we just to ignore these dishonorable ancestors? Do we say, okay, I'll honor these ancestors, but not those. I'll honor only the ones I can approve of. But that won't do. These dreadful people are also part of my heritage, and I cannot embrace my heritage without, while ignoring the hard parts. So I wrestled with this problem for years. I had no answer. Whenever I, then I watched the film Amistad, which by the way means friendship if you didn't know, and found a solution that makes sense to me. In the film, as John Quincy Adams is preparing to argue the case of the captured Africans before the Supreme Court, he has a conversation with the African leader, Chikwe. Chikwe speaks eloquently of his ancestors. He says that the line of his ancestors will stand with him and help because he is the culmination of their line. They act in history through him and they are honored by his honorable actions and life. They are honored by his honorable actions and life. Kenneth writes, and that's my answer. My ancestors' crimes against humanity cry out for redress, for atonement. Neither my ancestors nor the people they enslaved are still living. So how can these crimes be atoned for and by whom? He writes, by me. The ancestor act through me. We honor our dishonorable ancestors by acting honorably for them. My ancestors call out from beyond the grave for me to atone for their crimes and I honor them by I work for it to heal the wounds they inflicted. I forgive them by working to erase the very racism they embraced. I do not take their guilt on. I work to heal the wounds they inflicted. I work to create the heritage that I want my life to carry forward. So I don't think I have any slaveholders in my background. Could be wrong, I, I don't think so. I know actually one of our Congregants, Craig, is actually a descendant of General Sherman. And if you see a picture of General Sherman, you're like, oh yeah, you can see it. <laughs> so some of us have wonderful ancestors and who's done some really wonderful things, and some of us have some ancestors who have not done some really wonderful things. So for our meditation today, I just wanna invite you to think about your own ancestors. Whether they are good or bad, those monikers, good or bad, but whether or not you think that they acted honorably or dishonorably, but how do you honor and move forward with your ancestors? So please join me. Take a deep breath. Get settled in your seat. Just think about Kenneth's words and the heritage you would like to leave. I work to create the heritage that I want my life to carry forward. When you're ready, please join Barbara in singing. sing 
means to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. So I want to tell you another story today. Some of you know this person. Uh, about two and a half years ago, my neighbor, Bree, she used to come online in COVID uh, and listen to things. Some of you know that she was hit by a truck while riding her Vespa home from work one day. There is no doubt that the driver was completely at fault. Absolutely no doubt about it. Let's see, her back was broken, her uh, left hip, or no, right hip, uh, her, the left knee ligaments were completely torn. Uh, she broke fingers and toes, and she was in the hospital and rehab for about one and a half months. And the total cost of that was about uh, half a million dollars. And that doesn't even uh, take into account her lost time at work. She was paid hourly, as well as she never got her Vespa back. <laughs> um, and she was so proud of it. It was a brand new Vespa. But, uh, so you think, well, okay, well, insurance, right? That you think the truck driver would have insurance and all that sort of thing. But the driver was a contractor for a company, and the owner of that company had what's called, and this is as I don't pretend to understand it, but had something called a permissive use permit, which had only about 25K worth of insurance, which didn't cover much of anything at all. So Bree, of course, she did what many Americans do. She got a lawyer, right? One that specialized in an accident, and he hasn't done anything because her uh, accident actually doesn't fall in the realm of, of a big deal for him. So for two years now, she's been waiting to hear about anything, even though the driver and company are completely at fault. And she, matter of fact, she's never actually received an apology or even empathy from the company or driver. In fact, when the driver, when that happened, he came over to her as she's lying on the ground uh, bleeding. He said, do you need an ambulance? <laughs> and then he sat in his truck the entire time as she lay on the concrete in agony. She currently has to work two jobs to pay bills, and she will be in pain for the rest of her life. So when I was talking to her about this, I said, well, how do you feel about all of that? I mean, I was feeling righteously angry for her, right? Frustrated, like, I can't believe this. What in the world is going on here? But instead, she said something that just really hit me hard. She said, I feel unimportant, like my life is worth nothing, that I don't matter, and there's nothing I can do about it. Wow. That really hit home for me. There are stories, in a way, it mirrors what many black people have felt for generations. Here's someone, a white woman, who suffered a great hurt against herself, no fault to her, and will for the rest of her life, she'll experience that hurt. She's been deeply financially impacted, and has got absolutely no sympathy or reparations for her pain from the perpetrators, not the driver or the company. And this one instance, this one instance of indifference to her pain has made her feel hopeless and helpless. So imagine if you had a lifetime of it you had generations of being told you don't matter. When people talk about reparations, I should say when black people talk about reparations, I actually don't think that it's just about the money or the programs or the land or the apologies. I think it's about empathy. It's about wanting to be heard and feel like you matter. There's a reason why the slogan, Black Lives Matter, caught on so quickly. That word matter resonated with the black community, that sense of dignity and worth. It's important to us as human beings. We need to know that we matter in the world. And currently, there's a pervasive feeling among many black Americans that they don't matter. Because for generations, between prejudices and systemic racism, it told them that. For centuries, they told that their lives were worthless, first as slaves, then through Jim Crow, then redlining, indifference by the government and white people who just don't understand or don't want to understand, 
And this trauma, this sense of self, gets passed down generation to generation. I was really struck by listening to a, a professor. His name is uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Sowell. He's an economics professor, and he's black, and he's very much anti-reparations. I don't agree with a lot of his reasons for it, but uh, he had some really interesting things to say. And he spoke once of teaching at Cornell, and a black student came up to him and said, basically, yeah, you know, I'm going to get this degree from Cornell, which is a great university, but, but then what? Nothing matters. It's not going to make a difference. So when we talk about reparations, what I hear from many of the black people advocating for it is a desire to know that they matter. Because here's the thing about apologies, is they don't just heal the body, they can heal the soul. And reparations are a form of apology. They can tell people that they matter, that the world cares about them and their future. Because the reality is we can't go back and change slavery or Jim Crow but we can move forward and give people a sense that they matter. And yes, this also has to come from the black community, but our government and even us as individuals can play a part in that. And you know, it's a very liberal idea. I understand this. There's a very liberal idea. Is let's throw money at a situation, right? That'll assuage our liberal guilt and uh, you know, make us feel better, right? That's what we liberals tend to do. But money does help. I mean, let's face it, it does. But it needs to be more than that. So how do you apologize? How do you help people know that they matter? You say you're sorry, right? Which to me, after this long of a period, you do truth telling, right? And making sure it doesn't happen again. And that's part of the both and history that we can teach people, right? We talk about people, we, we talk to the people that are involved, we have relationships with them. And you do what you can to repair to make it right, and that's reparations. But the most brilliant thing I think that we can do is what General Sherman did 150 years ago when he asked them, well, what do you want? And in doing so, he gave them agency and told them that they matter. And these wise black ministers said all that they simply wanted to do was to build a life of their own. Now, many black scholars, not all of them, black scholars, activists, ministers, people who have thought about this for a long time have said what they want. And it isn't just cash compensation. Many of them know that that's not gonna work really well. Like again, that's just kind of throwing money after things. But some do advocate for that. Most of the wise black elders know that it isn't gonna solve all the problems, but there are other creative ideas. And here's just some of them that are out there. You talk about scholarships, waiving of students and other loans, apologies and acknowledgments of injustices, restorative justice, truth-telling in our history, representation in entertainment and other industries, low or no interest rates on loans, federal lands, lands given, free health care or education, the development of historical monuments, first-time homeowner programs, and economic development efforts to, devoted to communities that, where enslaved descendants, slave descended African Americans predominate, including inner city schools. There's a lot of different ideas. Those are just some of them. And of course, cash payouts are an option, but people tend to focus on that and get freaked out about how much money that they will be and who will pay for it. Most people agree that it's a government responsibility and people go, well, how in the world is the government gonna, ever gonna pay for something like this, right? I just wanna remind you all that our government recently came up with 5.7 trillion dollars to combat COVID. And 814 billion of that went to relief checks. 48 billion went to small businesses of which this church actually benefited as well. If the government wants to, money for all kinds of reparations is there. They just have to have the will to do it. And it, doesn't, it also doesn't have to be like some one lump sum or something like that. I think that people think that, that somehow that's gonna affect them personally that they're gonna have their pay docked or something like that, please don't go there. But let me just give you a few examples of some, that have, some things that have already been done. In 2021, $4 billion was set aside for socially disadvantaged farmers for debt relief. So people of color, farmers who had a hard time getting loans, or if they did, they got astronomical interest rates, had, their, had some debt relief. In 2021, Governor Newsom has authorized the return of a property known as Bruce's Beach to the descendants of black couples that had been unlawfully run out of Manhattan Beach. 
almost a century ago. Georgetown University found that they had saved their land by selling slaves, and they now offer scholarships to the descendants of those slaves. And in fact, the student body voted to increase tuition so as to create a fund to support the descendants. They've also renamed two buildings and are exploring other ways of providing restitution. And many churches, including UU churches, are offering the use of their buildings to activists involved in racial justice for free, as well as the use of copiers and Zoom accounts and other administration needs. But a lot of people are like Kenneth in our reading today. It's not so much about putting money out there, there are certainly ways to do that, but just working to right the wrongs of ancestors, working against racism and the systemic problems that they have. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that systemic racism isn't really any one person's fault. If you're white, it's not your fault. Don't, don't, don't be going, oh my goodness, I've gone now, I'm, I'm guilty or anything like that. Liberal guilt really just doesn't help anyone. But as a Unitarian Universalist, I believe in the dignity and worth of all persons. I affirm and I promote it. So that means I, I need to make sure that people know that they matter, right? And that they know that they matter. There are so many ways that we can do this. We can do this as a country, we can do this as a religious institution, and as individuals. Small things, even, help people know that they matter. And it's up to us to decide what we will do. But I hope that whatever you decide, you will join me in building a better world. So won't you come and go with me to that land? Let us sing. <laughs> Unitarian Universalist congregations are fully self-supporting, meaning that members and friends raise all the funds for the operating budget, ministries, and programs of the church. We are ever grateful for your gifts of time, treasure, and talent. OCUC amplifies that spirit of generosity by sharing half the plate we receive with an organization that shares our values. This month we are joining with Build Futures. Um, they're similar in a lot of ways to Stand Up For Kids. They take um, displaced youth and find homes for them. And, um, and in addition to providing bus passes and educational opportunities. So um, they're, they're picking up our poor kids up where people are living them off. Speaking of our service today. There are multiple ways in which you can support our church and this organization. You can mail a check. You can go through our website. Use an app called Vanco Mobile. 
or you can put cash in the offering baskets out by the doors. The choice is yours. All the information is on our website should you need it. As always, thank you for your generosity. Now, our offertory today is an African-American spiritual. While most songs we sing are copyrighted and we pay for that copyright, there are no copyright on African-American spirituals. Beth Syverson, our Director of Music Ministries, and Reverend Sean decided that this was one way that we can make some small reparations. Therefore, each time we sing an African-American spiritual in this church, we are making a small donation to the National Association of Negro Musicians. It's a 101-year-old organization that is very active in promoting black musicians and composers. In that great getting up morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. In that great getting up morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. In that great getting up morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. In that great getting up morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. When you hear that thunder rolling, fare thee well, fare thee well. When you see that lightning crashing, fare thee well. Fare thee well in that great getting up morning. Fare thee well, fare thee well in that great getting up morning. Fare thee well, fare thee well. There's a better day a coming. Fare thee well, fare thee well. There's a world of peace and justice. Fare thee well, fare thee well in that great getting up morning. Fare thee well. Fare thee well in that great getting up morning. Fare thee well, fare thee well in that great getting up morning. Fare thee well, fare thee well in that great getting up morning. Fare thee well, fare thee well in that great in that up morning. Fare thee well, getting up morning. That great in that morning. Fare thee well, fare thee well. In that great in that morning, fare thee well. Get up morning, that great in that morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. In that great get up, 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 get time of year when we raise funds for the operating budget uh, for this church through pledges of support from our members. I would like to invite Tatiana Hauser to the podium to share her pledge testimonial. Good morning. I discovered Unitarian Universalism in the summer of 2012, looking up local churches online. 
I was living in Michigan back then in Metro Detroit, newly married, looking for interesting different things to try out on a weekend. I stumbled upon a uni Universalist Unitarian Church and thought this religion must be a cult. It sounded too good to be true. It didn't resemble Russian Orthodoxy I knew growing up, any deviation from which was frowned upon, or any other religious community I came across during my life after coming to US in 1999. Fast forward 11 years, three kids, three countries, and three states later, I made sure to look up a UU church close to our new home in Costa Mesa. This time, religious education was very important to us as we wanted our children to have an opportunity to grow up in a progressive, open, and accepting environment and learn how to be good and do good in this world. So my family and I became friends of the OCUUC in 2019, and I became a member in 2020. I began volunteering as an RE teacher, and when pandemic was over and church reopened its doors uh, physically, I was excited to serve as an usher as well. February 2022 flipped my world upside down. I'm a Russian of Ukrainian descent and have close family in both countries. I couldn't accomplish simple household tasks. My people were killing my people and the world went on. I had to do something, but what? What could I possibly do to help even a little bit? And then my church opened its doors to my people. 20 Ukrainian refugees straight from Mexican border found sanctuary under this roof. OCUC gave me the opportunity to do what I can do best help my people get on their feet and make it in this country. Fast forward 11 plus months, OCUUC, all of you have helped 62 people flee the war and settle in California and other US states. 19 children don't have to hide in bomb shelters any longer. They go to school, play with friends, learn English, they do what all children should do, live in love and be loved. Why do I pledge to this church? Because pledging is the least I can do to give back to and sustain the community that brings this much good to this world. Truly changing this world, not just talking about it. I'm grateful for this church bringing out the best in me, helping me realize my true self, my full potential. I want OCUUC to thrive. I care deeply about this community and this religion. To me, it proves its truth every Sunday right here and every day over there in Unit 4, our Ukrainian refugee sanctuary. I wear this pen and it says, love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. And because of this church, I live it every day. Thank you. Uh, please join us in singing, we gather together a song that puts our intentions into words and expresses our gratitudes for the many gifts we share. Well, now is that time when we honor the important events and people in our lives, and you are invited, one and all, whether you are a member, friend, visitor, everyone is welcome to participate in this uh, weekly ritual that we call Joys and Sorrows. 
So I'd like to invite Lori Kluge up here. She's one of our pastoral care team members and she'll assist in lighting candles. And that's the idea is that if you'd like to honor such a joy or sorrow, you can come forward and light a candle at home. You can light a candle as well um, for yourself and we'll hold one for you here. If you'd like to share your joy or sorrow with the community, you can write it on a slip of paper that the ushers have over here. You can write it out and hand it to me as you come forward to light your candle and I'll read them out loud. The Zoomers, you can write, of course, yours in the chat and then Lori will light a candle for you. So please come forward um, and as music is played, I invite you to silently offer healing or celebration as you feel called and according to your own beliefs. So Hannah A. would uh, like a candle lit of hope, love, and apology to all marginalized folks who don't feel like they matter. And Matthew P. has both a concern and a joy. His concern is that he woke up today with another migraine, so had to miss work again. Uh, he says he's feeling better now, but still feeling rather tired and weak. And his joy is that his husband, Alex, is celebrating his 35th birthday tomorrow. Right. right on. And Linda C. says uh, that whoop, every day she says, I am joyous and grateful for the influence of my amazing and patient husband, Jim, as he deals with serious, serious challenges, and she prints it, and with me, <laughs> with grace and love. And Sarah J, our administrator, she has a can she would like a candle of joy lit. She said she just found out that she's been awarded two scholarships. What? Yeah. And Patrick B says he would like a candle lit for all the unhoused, including many of his friends who feel they don't matter and suffer discrimination regularly. Yeah. And Marilyn G, 
would like has would like a candle of joy she says for i have now completed all my radiation treatments as of this past friday and she said and my sister susan from phoenix who who was able to come up over this past week and to assist me with daily chores and drive me to and from treatment times and also very thankful for all the ocuc members who provided rides to me over the past two and a half months so yay she's done with radiation I think there's still some chemo to go, but she's done with radiation. Yes, and get her energy back. All right. And uh, let's see. So here in in the congregation, here in the room, so we have a uh, Jolyn and Joel Ibanez uh, lit a candle of joy because last night they hosted Rock and Roll Ain't for Fools. Uh, it's a request-based concert, 21 songs performed by uh, Joel and Jolyn, Chance, their son, Phil Chipman, uh, and his friend Tom, and a special guest, Amy Tompkins, uh, was there. She says it was an honor and a joy. I love when we can share these things. That's wonderful. So, Simone, I'll make your announcement later, but I just wanted to say that uh, she also has a candle of love and gratitude. She said her son, Philip, will be 51 on Tuesday in Lake Oswego, Oregon, and is uh, celebrating today with his beautiful wife and three children and the au pair as well. <laughs> So Reverend Judy, by the way, offered up these uh, flowers for all of us on this uh, first day of spring. Well, I guess it's not the first day right now, but it's close. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Maureen McConaughey uh, also has both a joy and a sorrow. So the sorrow is that her husband's uh, cousin, Gita, died last Sunday. She was 93. But she said, but no one was ready for her to leave us. She was bright and got her bar mitzvah at age 83 and caring. Wow. Maureen says, I will miss her. Yeah. Her joy is that she and her husband went to Tucson last weekend to see their daughter and were surprised to become witnesses to her marriage to her boyfriend, George, via Zoom. <laughs> Maureen said, we celebrated with a wildflower hike afterwards. So congratulations. <laughs> Wonderful. And Elizabeth Kay uh, lit a candle of acceptance. She says, April is Autism Awareness Month. If you didn't know that. She says, I'm so blessed to be part of a congregation that accepts and embraces all of our neurodivergent adults and children. Amen. Right on. All right, let us hold in love all the joys and celebrations and all the hurts and sadness, whether they were spoken or remain silent in our hearts. Let our joys remind us to be thankful, our concerns remind us to hope, and our sorrows remind us to connect. And let all these moments remind us that we're not alone. Please join Lori in a spirit of prayer. The Possibility of Righting the Wrongs of Our Kin, Adaptive, by Leslie Takahashi. Spirit of life, God of love, hear this cry which begins with the gratitude for the human ability to take action to right the wrongs of our kin. If you are the force of love, be loving to these dear ones who would rid the world of hatred and greed. If you are the force of possibility, seed opportunity for those who believe they are forgotten. If you are a larger freedom, break the chains of oppression and ignorance in which so many lives are bound. If you are the power of healing, please, oh please, Bring comfort to the ones who are hurting. Whatever you are, any force which allows us to reach beyond this reality to a more inclusive and loving presence, give energy to these precious ones who make a difference. Amen.
Let us join together as we extinguish the flame of our chalice and say together, we extinguish our chalice, but not the truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are a congregation made up of people who all believe differently. And yet when we gather together, whether we are in the room or on Zoom, we, we make up one loving community. We need not think alike to love alike. If you're a guest, a visitor, or someone who has not yet been known to us, I invite you to become a part of this beloved community. We encourage you to either write in the chat, if you're a Zoomer, or if you are a roomer, to stand for a brief moment and tell us your name and where you're from. And Susan will bring you a microphone so that you can be heard by the Zoomers as well. You want to light your chat? Yeah. Okay. If you'd like to know more about the church, including programming for our youth and children, please contact us at hello at ocuc.org and we will help you get connected. In addition, we invite you to sign up for our weekly email called The Blast at blast at ocuc.org. We want everyone to feel a part of this beloved community, so please reach out and we will help you get connected. Okay, so we've got a lot going on as usual. It's pledge time. Please get your pledge cards in. Um, there's a couple things I want to point out. First of all, there is a Passover Cedar that is next Saturday at five o'clock. And I, if you, if if you've ever, I'm sorry, Seder, sorry, not Cedar, <laughs> Seder, <laughs> uh, Seder. If you've never done this before, everyone is welcome, right? Absolutely, everybody is welcome. You don't have to be Jewish or anything like that. Everybody is welcome to the Seder. It's a wonderful time to learn about this incredible tradition. And uh, if you know anything about uh, Orthodox Seders, they last for hours and hours and hours. This one does not. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but you'll learn about the tradition and it's a wonderful way. I've been to the Seder myself and, and it's just absolutely wonderful and, and full of great companionship and learning and everything. So I want to really uh, encourage you to do that. Maureen uh, M over here, M McConaughey is going to be uh, doing it. So if you'd like to sign up with her, uh, you can also send me or her an email and we'll get you signed up as well. So, um, let's there, see here. Food. Huh? There's food. And there's food. Oh, yes. And there's, there's definitely food. Um, so uh, also, we've got something called, who here knows what blockchain technology is? Yeah, not that many. Yeah, I had to look it up. Um, <laughs> so our wonderful Dave Carlson uh, is actually becoming, uh, he's teaching on this, and he's going to bring that knowledge here. So it has to do with, uh, you've heard of Bitcoin. I assume everybody's heard of Bitcoin and electronic currency. It kind of has to do with that. Uh, and uh, so come out and learn about it because this is kind of the new way that people are looking at doing finances that could change a lot of the way that we do things in the world. So come and learn about that. It's going to be uh, in a couple of weeks uh, after church. Uh, we've got our auction. Put that on the list. That's over a month away, but put that on your calendar now. It's a big fun thing. And then the big deal is that our Ukrainians want to get to know us. Right, so they're next door, in this building next door, and they actually have cake for us today. They have an open house, I know, right, cake? They know we like cake. Uh, so they, they actually have kind of an open house. They want to invite you, they want to practice their English. Uh, so they really want to invite you over there. So uh, if you don't see them out there, go ahead and knock on the door. If you've been curious and want to know what's going on back there, because I've always been trying to be like, you know, hey, this is their space and, and everything like that and trying to be respectful. But today they're like, don't need to be respectful. Come on, <laughs> come over and say hello and, uh, and everything and get to know them. They're a good bunch of people and everything. So um, I am supposed to do a raffle but I don't know. Oh, there it is. Okay. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> I didn't see her do that. She That's snuck up on me. So as you know, for our pledge drive, right? So this year we've, every time, if you, as soon as you get your pledge in, you get a little ticket in here that gets put in here in this bowl. And we're having raffles for uh, $50 gift certificates. And the sooner you get it in, the more chances you have to win. Okay. And I don't I think there might be one more after this one but that'll be your last chance to win it. So get your pledge cards in. So we're going to do a raffle. So Jolynn, would you like to 
do the honors, shuffle it up in there. That's right. She is our Vanna. That's right. Reverend Sean Wilshire! No way! <laughs> no way! I did not set that up. No, we, baby. We you can, can do with it you want. We can do this over again. I, I don't need the fifty dollars. So let's do this. Over again. <laughs> Kill joy. <laughs> okay. Oh, John and Mitha. <laughs> right. <laughs> Somebody yelled out, Reverend Sean Wilshire. No, um, this is John and Mithonwi Kaiser. Where are all the our ushers? Our wonderful ushers. So they get that. Wonderful. How fantastic. There are two more drawings Oh, there's two, two more, more drawings. Two more drawings after this. Get your pled card, Jane. All right. Excellent. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you for the fun. <laughs> and I like to think I'm, I win all the time with you all. Sure you right? do. You know, you know. <laughs> all right, everyone. Let's go out there and make the world a better place. Let us sing our benediction. By the way, if anybody wants to attend the Passover Cedar this Saturday, Seder, Seder, thank you, Seder. Uh, uh, our wonderful Simone Bentley needs a ride. So if we could get her a ride, if you're coming, uh, talk to Maureen and to Simone. Simone, raise your hand. Okay, cool. And see if you can give her a ride. <laughs> thank you. Totally forgot. That's so cool. 